Hey S'mores, I'm Shannon Morris. Welcome to Morse Code. I do tech reviews and tutorials, so if you are looking for in-depth tech and gadget content, you've come to the right place. With the news of Qualcomm's second generation ultrasonic fingerprint sensor, which we heard about early in January, I believe, I ended up going down this extreme rabbit hole learning about all the different types of fingerprint sensors and how they differ in terms of security and privacy, but also efficiency and speed. If you're kind of a nerd like me, you will probably find this pretty interesting. I think it's pretty cool how they work and I hope that this breakdown will give you a clear understanding of which ones are best. But before I get started, I did want to thank this episode's sponsor, the Innovation Program. They have graduates who have worked with the program to develop their concepts into real-world technologies, so I will be featuring several innovators throughout this month. This one looks like something that I would see at a hacker con. It is so cool and I want to see it in person. This is called the Fluidized bed interface, and it's a unique take on the fluidized bed phenomenon. It looks like magic, but a fluidized bed occurs by pumping air into the bottom of a pool of granular substances, such as sand in this case. The force of the air meets the force of gravity, and that causes the sand to behave with properties like water, such as buoyancy, making things look like they are floating. The innovator Yasushi Matoba uses a combination of VR and AR to turn the fluidized bed of sand into an interactive playground. This includes using an infrared touch panel combined with the fluidized bed to create unique and I think they are beautiful patterns, images, and games that play out on top of the sand surface for an ultimate interactive experience. In the real world, this kind of technology could be used for flood evacuation simulation training. Yasushi Matoba was originally featured way back in March of 2017, and he has also been featured on television as well. Yasushi Matoba is just one of the many innovators that is exploring the world of the future. And you can see profiles and more innovations over at their website, innouvators.com. That's innovators.com slash en for English. Thank you so much to the Innovation Program for their support of my channel. So fingerprints are unique. We know this. And because they are unique, companies can use them for identity verification. But that verification is implemented implemented in a lot of different ways. And this tech just keeps getting better and better. It's getting more secure and faster too. So first up, we have optical scanners. These have been around for a really long time. These use a charge coupled device, which is CCD. It's the same thing that you would find in a digital camera, for example. It's a light sensor. This array of light sensitive diodes called photocytes generate light that glows onto your finger whenever pressed down on a glass plate. They generate electrical signals in response to light photons. Each of the photocytes records a pixel that can be light or dark pixels from the image, and that forms an image of itself. So it basically shines a bright light over your fingertip and it takes a digital photo. Light sensitive microchips look at ridges and valleys of fingerprints and they turn them into ones and zeros to create your unique code. This is analog to digital conversion in a scanner that processes that analog electrical signal to generate a digital image to fingerprint. Now with this said, errors can happen. If a photo is too dark or too light, it could be rejected and a new scan will need to be retried. The disadvantage of this is digital photos could be replicated. So this is the least secure option of the bunch. You can generally tell if you're placing your finger on an optical scanner whenever the LEDs under the glass light up and they beam onto your finger and they light up your fingerprint as it is scanned. These are used at facilities like DMVs and inexpensive smartphones. The next one we have is capacitive sensors. These are more common than they're found on a lot of different phones. These measure your finger by using human conductivity. They create an electrostatic field. They basically create a digital image based on that electrostatic field. So they use tiny capacitor array circuits which track details in your fingerprint. So that includes things like your ridges. So for example, ridges in your fingerprint, whenever you place them on a conductive plate, create 
create changes in the charge stored in the capacitor. Valleys, on the other hand, which are also found on your fingerprint, leave the charge on the capacitor unchanged. So optionally, there's also an amplifier integrator circuit that can track changes and record them with an analog to digital converter so digital data can get analyzed. There's a big advantage to this one. It's harder to bypass. Images cannot get past capacitive fingerprint sensors because it takes a much more advanced picture of your fingerprint. Other materials will record differences in the charges on the capacitor, so even a fake mold of your finger might not necessarily trick it if the device is using a higher end option for a capacitive sensor. Newer types can support gesture controls like swiping, which is something that we have seen in Pixel's capacitive sensors. They are more expensive and they are also more complex and more secure. The third one is kind of a merging of the first two, and this is called an optical capacitive sensor. This one can also be hidden in a display. It's cheaper than ultrasonic, and these combine the real touch of capacitive sensors and scanners with the speed and efficiency of the optical versions. Now, the last one that I really wanted to mention is called ultrasonic. These ones use an ultrasonic transmitter and a receiver. An ultrasonic pulse is transmitted against the finger, and the pulse is partially absorbed by the the finger and partially bounces back to the sensor. Now this varies a lot based on the ridges in your finger, the pores, and the really minute details that you wouldn't necessarily pick up with one of the other sensors. The intensity is calculated at different spots on the sensor using mechanical stress detection. So a longer period of scanning can equal more additional data about depth. So this entire process gives the sensor a super high res 3D scanning of your fingerprint in a reproduction. Basically, it is 3D, so it is going to be more secure than a 2D image. One of the cool things is it can also detect blood flow as well in certain types of ultrasonic sensors. Now, this works even if your finger is wet too. So if you're outside and it's snowing, or maybe you are playing in a pool, or if you're just like chilling on your phone while you're in the bath, you can still unlock your phone with a wet fingerprint. So the first generation of this was not as fast as other implants. Implementation, so a lot of people didn't particularly like ultrasonic because of its convenience factor. But as far as security goes, it's way better. Now this one also, there was a caveat. This happened, I believe, last year. They had an issue with screen protectors on Samsung phones letting anybody into the phone. Because they were so sensitive, it had issues whenever people put screen protectors on their phone, which a lot of us do. Now the second generation, which is by Qualcomm, is much, much faster. The second generation is also a thinner sensor, so it could be used in folding displays. I feel like I'm telling the future here. Hmm. The issue with ultrasonic though is, again, it's more expensive, so you won't find it in a lot of those less expensive phones. So now we move on to my favorite part, which is talking all about the cryptography, the security of the sensors. So the sensor includes a little integrated circuit, which is also called an IC in the hardware world, and that scans and transmits data to the main processor inside of the device, whether that's your phone or any other device that you unlock with a fingerprint. The sensor compares small, distinguishable features inside of your fingerprint, which are called minutia, instead of trying to scan the entire fingerprint, which speeds up the whole process. So this also ends up helping with errors from humans, since humans might place their finger off center from the fingerprint, or you might get a scratch in the middle of your finger, and then you couldn't like press down your finger on the fingerprint without it getting scanned. What would you do? Well, it turns out because of those minutia details that it's looking for, little pinpoint points in your fingerprint, it doesn't matter. It'll still be able to read it and match it up with the correct data. Now, where does your data go? Well, data is not uploaded online. It's kept locally in a physical chip using a cryptographic technique. This is called Trusted Execution Environment, or TEE for short, which you might find online if you read articles and white papers about fingerprint sensors. Now, this is a secure chip that can be used for more than just fingerprint scan storage. But in the case of fingerprint scans, 
applications that use the TEE client API can access information stored within that chip. So different companies use different techniques to secure the data, but they all reside in some kind of chip. So for example, Google uses the Titan M security chip for biometrics, Samsung uses Samsung Knox, and Apple uses their secure enclave. Now I mentioned Apple, even though there's not Touch ID this year with the iPhone 12, because there are rumors that Apple might reintroduce Touch ID as an option, but this time as an in-display fingerprint sensor, but that's yet to be determined. Now Qualcomm uses a secure MSM architecture and secure processing unit, or SPU. They are basically all the same, kind of, mostly for a high level for storage of the fingerprint data. So you don't have to worry too much about the branding or anything, just make sure that it's stored locally and it's not transmitted. Now, how is this data used by other apps though? Since it's not transmitted, how do you actually use it to get online or log in to all these applications and websites? So the FIDO Alliance, that's Fast Identity Online. You've probably heard of me mention them when I talk about like the YubiKeys or Titan Security or anything like that. FIDO is very popular within the identification online community. <laughs> they have protocols that use this data for authentication. So this allows you to log into your app with just your fingerprint, even though that data never actually leaves your device. So your device is passing digital keys rather than the biometric data to the app's servers in order for you to unlock your phone or unlock the applications that you wanna log into. But your own private key pair is locked away on that secure chip. So they're only getting a partial bit of that key. It's kind of like a handshake, but part of it is still secret. Now there are a bunch of different companies which are manufacturing fingerprint sensors and they sell this tech to phone manufacturers. So a lot of it comes down to price. We know about Qualcomm already. Their tech is in the premium Samsung phones, for example, but there's also Synaptix and Goodix. Goodix has optical sensors in Huawei phones, Oppo, and OnePlus phones, for example. Now, Sweden-based fingerprint cards, that's the brand name, they power the capacitive sensor in the Pixel 3a, for example. Now, the last thing that I wanted to mention with this is the thing is fingerprints are physical attributes that are harder to fake. They can't be guessed, they can't be replaced, and you won't ever forget them like you could a password. But that also means that they can't be changed. So if somebody got access to your fingerprint, they they could copy it to trick a sensor using a simple image or a mold, assuming that the sensor was not super secure, or somebody could just take your finger. That would be really gross. Now you can't change it like you can a password, but once it's burned, it's going to be burned. Also keep in mind in the court of law, especially here in the US, whether a law enforcement officer can compel you to use a fingerprint to unlock your phone if you are like arrested, for example, that has been tossed back and forth for a very, very long time. There's like this huge controversy about it. So most recently, it looks like fingerprints are not covered under the Fifth Amendment as they are not considered physical testimonial communication. So a cop could use your fingerprint or face ID to unlock a phone, but they could not use your passcode or a pin. Now there is also an argument to be had about which finger you should use to unlock your phone. Should you use your thumb instead? Or maybe your pinky? You could use any of them. You don't have to use your pointer finger. You don't have to use the obvious one. And you could set it so that there's a maximum number of tries before the phone erases itself. That's within your settings. Now with all of the different types and the legal issues around biometrics, this is why I'm so curious about the security and privacy of fingerprint sensor techniques. Any user should consider their own risk assessment to figure out which type of authentication is best for their own use case. Fingerprint sensors are great, but some folks might not want to use them if you need to keep sensitive or like proprietary work information on your phone. Myself, I do use the fingerprint sensor. I enjoy the convenience, especially since I'm switching phones so often since I review them all the time. So having that ease of access is something that I need to have. Having that convenience is something that I need to have, but I have also determined my risk assessment to be okay with that. One thing that I do though, is I do switch the digit as far as which one unlocks my phone. And I also turn on the erasing of your data after like 10 or 15 tries. I am curious what kind of security or privacy concepts do you want to see me break down? Comment below, let me know. Don't forget to subscribe as well and and thank you so much to my s'mores for being a part of this amazing community and for watching these videos. That always helps. I'm Shannon Morse and I will see you soon. Bye y'all.